Good evening, everyone. This is Randy Pennsylvania with the Native Plant Society of Texas, Williamson County. Uh, this is our monthly chapter meeting, and this the uh, plant of the month this month is frostweed. This is one that grows out in your nature areas when you can't find anything to grow underneath that oak tree. This one uh, will do a very nice job. It has very large leaves, so it does a lot of shade. It's also a great plant for all your pollinators. It's very deer resistant and it does spread. So, and it, it can get anywhere from six to uh, three to six feet is normal, but with a lot of water or too rich a soil, it can get taller. And that is our plant of the month. And I wanted to also show you how beautiful the flowers are. This is a cluster flower on the on the top of each stem. And then to the right, it's known for its ribbons of ice. When it gets below freezing temperature, a good freeze, uh, the stem will burst and the ice comes forward, out comes out in ribbons. And the ribbons make all different patterns. You may be out hiking a nature area and look down and think someone's dropped a, a Kleenex tissue on the ground but it may be frostweed. So this is a very important plant for our pollinators. If you see it out, please uh, go up and investigate it and don't mow it down. Hey, Randy, this is Gary. I just wanted to add to yeah. that. Uh, sure. About the, uh, the temperature, you know, if, if it's just 32, mm -hmm. you probably won't see it. It needs to drop a little bit lower, sure. at least in, in my yard, the frostweed weed is fairly close to the house, so it's got to be in the 20s before I before yeah. I'll see that. Yeah, I think the stem probably has to reach 32 or so. Right. Uh, and then the ground's usually warmer than the air temperature, so that probably keeps it from splitting unless it's a good freeze. Exactly, but they're very beautiful yeah. when they do that. But it's... They are gorgeous, and it doesn't kill the plant that I've seen. No, nope, but it's gone quick, so you got to get it there early when you know that it's going to be a yeah. pretty cold night the next morning. It is fragile. It's uh, it's so thin that it uh, disappears with the least little bit of heat. And, I, you know, I don't know what the purpose of that is, but it's very interesting. Oh, that's I'm a good sure idea. nature has a purpose. Good question about that, if there's a purpose yeah. for it. Yeah. Okay. okay. No, nope, that's all good, Gary. Uh, activity since our last meeting, we've developed our 2021 budget. Uh, the Board of Directors has approved that. We based it on going back to the farmer's markets, which we are doing soon. We'll talk about that in a minute. And we just assumed worst case would be nothing but farmer's markets instead of uh, going out to Wildflower Center. So far, we haven't heard anything about them starting up there plant sales again uh, in the spring. We we also reduced our spending because of a reduced income. And so that's good. And we ended up with a slight decrease in bank balance. And that's assuming that we spend everything we plan to spend. Uh, historically, we don't spend as much as we budget. So we'll, we'll see how things go. But we did scrub the budget pretty good and try to get a true uh, estimate of what we would spend so that we had a, a little better accuracy this year, given the situation. Georgetown Newcomers, this is a presentation that I gave and Denny Shea, your vice president, he came with me and we talked to a group of, of Georgetown citizens at, uh, about the top 22 Texas native plants for Williamson County. This was done outdoors at the Berry Springs Park and Pavilion. And I, I'm surprised I didn't put a picture in here. I meant to, um, my apologies. But uh, this was at the Berry Springs Park and Preserve and it was a very nice day and everyone had a great time. Uh, really interesting. Uh, I didn't have a slideshow, which is always interesting. You get a little more uh, involved with the audience and I had some good uh, plants to display. So that was fun. Everyone social distance, we had plenty of room and we used our masks. Activities, some more. We're still continuing to take care of our gardens. We haven't had any requests for new gardens. 
Uh, and of course, Charles has continued his battle against the invasive plants at the various parks in the area. Berry Springs is uh, one of the ones he's, he's starting to wrap up there and looking forward to a couple of other parks. He started in Gary Park, and also he's working on two Texas Land Cons Conservancy Preserves, Berry Creek and River Oaks. And speaking of Charles, uh, we want to congratu congratulate him. He has won the state's 2020 Nancy Benedict Memorial Award. And this is for all his work over the years in organizing volunteers and uh, removing invasives and improving the native habitat for our, our wildlife areas in the parks. Georgetown and Williamson County in particular has quite a few wonderful parks and we want to preserve those. So we really appreciate all the work Charles has done and continues to do and we support him wholeheartedly. If you're interested in helping out in any of that, uh, I think he's got a couple of volunteers right now, but when he needs volunteers, uh, you can give him a call. Or, uh, actually, you can contact him through our blog and uh, see if he needs any more volunteers. Thank you, Charles. We really appreciate all you do. We're going back to the farmer's market for the fall plant sale. We're going to need volunteers. If you can volunteer, please contact Beth Irwin. Again, through our blog, there's a description, a lot of detail about the plant sale on our website. So go there. Um, we need people to haul plants, set up booths, sales assistants and cashiers. Uh, the nice part about uh, the farmer's markets is they're short and sweet. Uh, they do practice social distancing. Everything is enforced and they're good, safe places. But uh, you decide what you're comfortable doing. And uh, that's that's what everyone needs to do. So please also contact Beth Irwin if you would like to order something special. Uh, she will do her best to try and get it. And there is a plant list posted on our website. So take a look at that, see see what you might need. And I would say the the uh, time to plant is the fall. That's when you're getting into some rains. And the temperatures are cooler, so it's much easier on the plants, and they will spend their energy putting down roots. So fall is the best best time in Texas to be planting all your woody trees and shrubs and woody perennials. Those uh, really benefit a lot from a fall planting. And spring is nice too, but uh, I do a lot of planting in the fall and try to do very little in the spring. Upcoming programs, we have UT, University of Texas, and Dell Medical Center, Native Landscaping. This is by Justin Hayes, who's a landscape supervisor out there. So he's got a lot of good information for us coming up November 12th. Again, we'll be virtual, so please tune in. Uh, if you haven't signed up on our blog yet, go ahead and sign up. And we'll send you an email reminding you about his upcoming talk. And if you have any speaker suggestions, please feel free to uh, send it over on the chat line or uh, send it to Susie Hickman or any, just fill out any form on our blog and it'll get to get to Susie and we'll do our best to get the talk about the speaker and, and get them here for you. Tonight, we are the Williamson County chapter of the Native Plant Society of Texas. You can find out what we're up to on our, personally, our, our best site is our, our uh, blog and signing up for automated emails. We also have all our speakers that we've done uh, over this past uh, shutdown on YouTube. And Facebook and Instagram, we are posting on that now and getting better at it. And I would like to introduce our speaker Jane Tillman is with the Austin Native Plant Society of Texas, Austin chapter, and she is a past president there. Also, she is a master naturalist, and she is Travis Autobahn Society member and a great birder. Uh, she's part of the team that developed our Native Plant Society, or our NIPSOT Native Landscape for Birds companion class, 
and that is about birds and the plant interaction, which uh, tonight she'll be presenting some of that, but the class goes into a lot more depth and is, uh, tells you about a lot more plants. So when you see that uh, coming around, join in. We're gonna give away one book to a lucky winner. Gary will do a random number drawing and take the list of attendees and I will contact you via email to let you know you've won. You can send me your address. I'll provide the book through Amazon directly to your home. So, uh, and don't forget, Jane Yard has also received the Best of Texas Backyard Wildlife Habitat certification. So thank you very much for being here tonight, Jane. And we turn it over to you. Thank you. Factor those two out. Everything else is provided by native plants, you know? So we're gonna take a look at what birds eat here in a minute. But long before we had bird feeders, and I have to tell you, I teach a lot of bird classes and a lot of people really do think that birds eat seed and hummingbirds drink nectar, and that's about the size of it. But really and truly, most songbirds will not be caught dead looking at your bird feeder. You know, they're after other prey in your yard. So long before we had bird feeders and long before we got into this of providing nest boxes, native plants were there to meet the needs of birds. And since we don't really know if some of you are, this is like your first um, foray into a native plant talk because you like birds, thought I should put out a definition. And there are several different definitions of native plants, but I like this one from the Natural Resource Conservation Service that says, what is a native plant? A plant that is part of the balance of nature that has been there developing and co-evolving for thousands of years and probably hundreds of thousands of years in a particular region or ecosystem and, and was here pre-European settlement. So, you know, I've heard pre-European, I've heard the last ice age, which would be like 11,000 years ago. Anyway, um, a long time ago. So that would be a native plant and really to be accurate, a native plant should be specific to a certain geographic region. And we're kind of we're kind of, of mixed minds, I'd say, in the Native Plant Society, because we do pl borrow plants from other regions of Texas and find that they do well pretty, here, pr pretty well here. And as time goes on and we experience plants shifting north, just like birds are shifting north, we might be able to support more South Texas plants, who knows? Why do we like native plants so much? Well, first of all, they're beautiful and they they give character our character to where we live. So that's to me, they're just wonderful plants. They're adapted to our droughts and floods, you know, so they may not look the greatest when they come through a drought, but they survive. They're adapted to our soils. And so that means that some plants are not gonna do well in other soils. So you have to think about that. They're generally disease resistant. Um, and most importantly, perhaps they provide habitat and food for wildlife. Then they've co-evolved over eons in order to provide food at the time that wildlife needs it. So for example, that monarch butterfly and the frostweed that's blooming right now. So. Some of you are probably familiar with Doug Talman. You've heard him speak. He's an entomologist at University of Delaware, and he's got some great books out, Bringing Nature Home, Nature Home, Nature's Best Hope is his new one, like Randy said, and I highly recommend you read those um, just to get a good grounding in, in what's happening when we basically scrape the landscape and don't have anything left for wildlife to eat, particularly pollinators. So here's a nice relationship on this slide. You know, native lantana, which is one you really should ask for by its scientific name. It's either lantana horrida or urticoides. Um, this plant provides nectar for your butterflies and bees and such. I also almost got run over by a hummingbird the other day as it was on its way to my lantana. So it's a good nectar source for hummingbirds. But so often native plants provide double duty. So in this case, it's providing nectar 
but once the berries are set, little birds like this wintering ruby crown kinglet will come and eat the berries. And I've watched robins and mockingbirds almost at my feet, oblivious to me while they went after the berries of the native lantana, helping to spread it around. So it's really obvious to see that connection between a bird and a berry. And a lot of the plants I'll mention tonight are burying plants. But you know, there's that intermediate step a lot of times where you've got to have an insect pollinator to get to that berry. Bumblebees and other bees, as we know, are declining. And I just want to say, when you think about this connection between birds and bumblebees, you go, huh? You know, who eats a bumblebee? Well, I was at the Wildflower Center several times over the last month, uh, the last couple of months, and this mealy blue sage, Salvia farinacea, was just crawling with native bees. And I thought, well, isn't that fantastic? Blue is one of their favorite colors. And isn't it great that summer tanagers, which are a summer bird for us, is a bee and wasp specialist. They have pretty darn thick bills. And I watched them. This one was right outside my window and it tore apart this wasp. Now, it's not an easy task to, to eat a wasp. It actually took it several minutes really to, to kill it and kind of soften it up before it went down the hatch. But I've also watched them do that with bees. As a matter of fact, it's such a bee specialist that down in Mexico, some of them are shot by beekeepers because they do go after their bees. So it's just another connection between plants, the mealy blue sage, you know, an insect and a and a bird and, and something that we may not think of, that kind of association. So I feel like it's important to spend just a few minutes to think about, you know, what, what birds eat. Clearly it depends on the bird and a lot of times you can tell by their beak as to uh, what their food preferences are going to be. This little hummingbird, you know, it's got a thin, narrow, long beak or bill and to help it get into that narrow little, you know, tube. Um, they do like tubular flowers. They, when they come into your yard for particularly the color red plants, they do check around though, and they'll visit other colors too. They will go to blue, they'll go to orange, they'll go to white, so, um, but red will bring them in. They do have pretty long tongues to get into the bottom of these, these uh, flower nectaries. There are some birds out there that eat sap and one that's showing up right now is the yellow-bellied sapsucker. It's a wintering bird here and it'll drill sap wells usually on trees that aren't as healthy um, and it'll go all the way around the tree and that'll ooze the sap out. So it'll eat the sap plus it'll also eat the insects that get trapped in the sap. Well, it's a considered a keystone species up north because it will migrate earlier than say the warblers. And, um, and if you have weather where it sets the insect population back, which is what the warblers need, then they will come to the sap wells to eat. And I've seen ruby crown kinglets at sap. I've seen butterflies at sap. So it's an important food source. This is a rare uh, central, very rare central Texas bird. But here's one that's coming to sap, you know, on a, uh, at a time when really there were not that many insects available. Birds eat lots of fruits and berries, and we know that. And here's an American robin with a sumac ber berry. The robins are year round um, in our area, but we do have more in the wintertime. And, and uh, they do sometimes get to be big winter flocks and they come in and decimate a whole population of burying plants and then they, they move on. But there's strength in numbers and safety in numbers and that's why they do that. Plus they see more. So birds eat a lot of nuts and seeds. And uh, in this picture, we have a, a gorgeous blue jay. Blue jays cache a lot of acorns over the winter, one blue jay can cache about three to 5,000 acorns, and they're very good at picking out the ones that don't have weevils in them. And then they don't remember to 
to find them all to eat them. And so we have the next generation of oak trees, which is pretty great. So you have birds providing ecosystem services. And then over here, we have a little lesser goldfinch that's on a, a sunflower. And um, of course, you know, eventually it'll help spread some of the seeds of that particular plant. So, so uh, you may notice lesser goldfinches in your yard. They're here also year round. So nuts and seeds are a big part of birds that have a, a slightly different bill, obviously, because this is an omnivorous bird's bill, and this one is really adapted for seeds. Birds eat um, foliage and buds, too. And here is a plateau goldeneye, which is a wonderful fall blooming plant here in Central Texas. Now is the peak time for it, so keep an eye out for it. I'm sure you've got it blooming in Georgetown. But in my yard, I watched one day while these lesser goldfinches, there's one, two, three, uh, four, five in here, and they were eating the, the leaves. And they do that with things like Swiss chard too. They do it with white mist flower also. So I, I forget, you all might have some other experience with things you've noticed, but, but birds do eat foliage and buds. And then, here is a remarkable picture of a black chin hummingbird catching a gnat. I hope you can see this little gnat over here. You probably know that hummingbirds don't live on nectar alone and they need protein and they get it from these little, little insects. They'll eat those and they'll eat aphids, um, anything that's not bigger than they are basically. And um, so uh, they're eating invertebrates. And invertebrates are really critical to most of our bird species. So we need to spend a minute to think about them, about the invertebrates out there. And when we think about um, native plants, a lot of native plants are larval host plants for different butterflies and moths, plus they are providing food to things like beetles, of which there are lots and lots and lots in the world. But Douglas Tallamy has done this research looking at native plants and um, the number of lepidopterans, so moths and butterflies, caterpillars that they'll support, and they see, you know, a large number. This is for northeastern U.S. oaks, so it, but it's probably pretty similar down here. The Prunus genus, 456, so that would be things like our Mexican plum and escarpment black cherry. The willows, which some people regard as rather weedy trees, they're tremendous. Actually, if you ever want to look for warblers, go look in the willows because they support a lot of, of caterpillars. The ulmus, which also includes hackberries, are a good source. And contrast that with something like non-native Nandina which so far nothing has figured out how to eat. So it's interesting because 90% um, of, of insects that eat plant only will eat the plants of certain species. Like usually it's limited to, to one or two plant families. So our big concern and why we want you to plant native plants partially is to get some of those plants back into the ecosystem because if they're not there, we're not gonna have the caterpillars either. And then we're going to see perhaps further crashes in our, our bird populations, which many of them are not doing that well. So a non-native ligustrum, it supports some, um, but not nearly in these. And there's a lot of data that we still need on different plants and, and what caterpillars they support. But in this picture, you see a little, little tiny caterpillar that a cardinal is taking back to its young. Anytime you see a bird carrying food, it's not gonna eat it. It's gonna take it back to a nest. And these guys can have three broods a year. Anyway, it takes about six to 9,000 caterpillars, hopefully slightly bigger than this, to, um, to raise a brood of chickadees, okay, a different little bird. So clearly we need a lot of caterpillars out there. So I could have entitled this taught garden for caterpillars almost, because they're so critical. 96% of 
our land birds, which is our songbirds. It's, it's um, you know, our, our birds that are, are in our backyards or in our forests, you know, not the shore birds, not the, the uh, water birds like the herons, those kinds of things. 96% of our land birds feed their young Lepidoptera in order to have the best chance it grows. So they provide protein, they provide lipids, which is fats, and they also pro provide carotenoids, which will help them get, get their beautiful colored feathers that they have that helps them with, you know, breeding. Different other birds eat vertebrates. And here we're looking at this lovely little screech owl with an anole or an anole in its beak. And, uh, you know, that means we need to provide whatever that little anole needs in order to have it be available for that little screech owl. Um, the, so they eat a lot of caterpillars and insects too. So what would another vertebrate be? Well, if it's your great horned owl, it could be a skunk, it could be a rabbit, you know, it could be a, a frog or a toad or a snake, all those things. It'll be another bird, you know, some birds eat birds, that's their specialty. So we gotta provide basically for that whole food web that's out there, which you learned back in grade school. And so we kind of, when we're thinking about the importance of insects and other prey for birds, we have to think about the impact of pesticides. And, and there is a disconnect and we're, we all probably, um, you know, think that have thought of this way at some point in our lives where we thought, well, if I can use a little bit of pesticide, more is probably better. Um, but I also want to have my backyard bird paradise. So I want to put some bird feed out there, but at the same time, I'm going to use insect killer and bug stop in order to get those pesky bugs away from my, my plants. Perhaps they're being chewed on. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services says that homeowners use 10 times the amount of pesticides per acre as farmers use on their crops. So we kind of overdo it in that particular department. And this has big implications for our birds. Okay, enough said. Birds need shelter and places to raise young. Well, where do they find it? In their, in native plants. And this, um, chart is from Texas Parks and Wildlife, and it just gives us a better understanding of how birds um, get, how they use the niches, you know, vertical space, because different species have preferences for different, for different parts of the habitat. Like, you know, you see vultures and hawks above the canopy. Um, you see owls and woodpeckers, thrushes, and many of the warblers up in the canopy. I'm very fortunate where I live. I'm looking out a uh, second story and right into my live oaks, so I see a lot of life going on out there, and that's where the tanagers are, and that's where a lot of the vireos and warblers come through. Mid-story, so you know, it here it's listing some plants that fall into those categories. Um, but it kind of depends on where your plants are and their growth as to whether they're mid-story or canopy. To me, this is, you know, in maybe the 20 to 30 foot range. Then we get into the understory, maybe, you know, four to eight to 12 feet, that kind of thing. And then you have your ground layer. So it's just different, different birds have different preferences for parts of the habitat. So if you can provide different vertical niches, especially this understory layer, you probably are going to be able to attract more birds. You need to provide evergreens for shelter if you can. A really good one is a plant that is very easy to find, mountain laurel. Um, I've, I have a slide in another show of a little screech owl that's buried deep in this mountain laurel so that he cannot be harassed by little birds that like to harass owls. They don't like them because they'll eat them. And uh, so this one is out in the open. So it really needs to have a little bit deeper shelter. So begin to think about what you can do to provide evergreen shelter for your, your birds. So they have places to roost if they're a little screech owl or places to forage or get out of the cold wind if it's a smaller bird. And shelter can also be something as 
simple as leaving leaf litter in your yard. And uh, leaf litter really helps control humidity. It increases the humidity of the soil. It re re helps it retain moisture. So it makes it more attractive to things like your amphibians um, and your reptiles that might be needing a place to hunker down. Plus there's a whole variety of, of um, insects that, that uh, are gonna be in the soil. It helps prevent soil erosion too. There's something, um, there's a, a spotted toey. That's a, a bird that's gonna be coming here. I'm sorry, there's an insect after me somewhat for some reason. A spotted toey is, is a bird that scratches the soil and kind of kicks back. And um, in the process, it un uncovers insects to eat. So a uh, nice leaf litter layer helps preserve its insect life that it's after. Plus, native plants provide trees, dead and dying trees, snags, so that birds like this red-bellied woodpecker can get in there and create a cavity for its young. And then usually you have uh, birds that'll move in after the red bellies have used them for one season. Like this would be a big enough hole for screech owls to use. So they might move in. Cavities are in such short supply and that's why people have taken to putting up a lot of nest boxes. And I wanted to give you just an example of, of um, cardinal nest sites. Just, it would be applicable to a lot of different species, but this is where people have been, have observed cardinals building, building nests. Cedar elm's a great tree, yopons, they really like to nest in yopons because they're kind of prickly and we'll get back to them in a minute. But even in something as tall as a cypress tree, as low to the ground as an elbow bush can be, or even in agarita, a nice prickly shrub that you may already be familiar with. And they use the, the um, different parts of, of a native plant in order to be, well, that are as building blocks for their, for their nests. So now we'll get into some of the plants. And again, let's see, um, I, I make sure we don't run over. So I'm gonna kind of just go through these and then you can do a little bit more research on them. But Plateau Live Oak, Quercus fusiformis is a great plant if you have the space for it. It is more of a spreading plant. You know, it's, a, it's evergreen, it drops its leaves all at once in the spring and then you have all those little caterpillars that come out of the tree and get on you and kind of you know look like inchworms that kind of thing but they're not they're oak rollers and they are a tremendous food source for migrating warblers and also a good food source for the birds that are raising their first brood of the year at about that same time so um, plateau live oaks do create a lot of shade which has its pluses and its minuses as a gardener knows, because you know it, it. It sometimes is more challenging to have a shady garden than a than a sun garden. A lot of people, and unfortunately, um, a lot of common practice is to clear away all that stuff under the live oaks so that the live oaks will flourish. Well, live oaks and the plants that are their understory have been doing this for time immemorial. And there's a nice healthy group of understory plants that do very well and like this sort of landscape. And they're not sapping nutrients from the tree. So if you want to try to introduce them back, or if you're building a new house and can save some of the understory around your live oaks, more power to you. But under here we have, it's kind of hard to tell in this picture, there's aromatic sumac, cedar sage, a volunteer little persimmon, and then back here some elbow bush. So all this is habitat for insects and amphibians and reptiles so that then they can support the birds. This is just looking at it from a bird point of view. Cedar elm, this, this tree, so on the left we have a live oak. And on the right here, we have a cedar elm. And this is the pretty much the growth habit. It's, it's kind of tall and not so wide. So to me, a tall rectangle. And it, some of them are already beginning to get their 
fall color. Well, it's a, a good larval host plant for a couple of neat butterflies. And, you know, butterflies are just a drop in the bucket compar compared to the number of moth species that are out there that we don't even know who's using what as a larval host. So it probably supports some of them too. And uh, it is the plant that's kind of fun. It's got those quirky wings on young plants and it's got a, a rather deeply um, incised bark, which is attractive. But to me, one of the things that's pretty cool about this lovely tree is um, the fact that it has these one, this, this little dry, dry, papery sort of covering, and each one of these is a seed. And it's a tremendous food source for birds like our cardinals and our um, house finches. And these are, are, are happening now. So if you go out and see an uh, cedar elm, look for the cedar elm samaras and look all over the ground below and they're like confetti. So this is gonna be seed that's gonna feed other wildlife until it's gone. Um, so this is a tree that does like basically sun to part shade. I find that it, it needs a little bit more moisture, but in some places it doesn't appear that that's the case. It's a very nice long lived shade tree. And of course the benefit of it over an oak is you don't have to worry about oak wilt. Um, ash junipers is a tree that people love to hate, but look at it, it's one of our, our evergreen shelter plants. It's got a, it's a tremendous berry source. It's a host plant for a really neat little butterfly, the olive hair streak, olive juniper hair streak, and birds vote with their beaks. These are all birds, cedar waxwings, which will be here. You know, they really come in mostly in December, January, February, March, April. They leave by May and they are big berry eaters, robins, Mockingbirds, they tried their best to defend their food source from everybody else, but sometimes they're not that successful. And then cardinals, they would, these would be all common birds that like those juniper berries. So just try to remind yourself of that when you're, you know, sniffling come spring, early spring, because it is a wind pollinated plant. It does have beautiful bark that comes off in strips um, in the older trees, and that's building block for golden cheek warblers to build their nests. So some of you may live in places where really and truly your yard is not the, it's maybe the lot is too small to put a big oak in or just, you know, so you just have to make decisions, but you can have a perfectly wonderful bird friendly landscape using smaller more ornamental trees, and then adding understory to that. Two of the best, I mentioned the Yopon earlier. These are tremendous berry producing uh, shrubs tr or trees. They are very adaptable to sun, to part shade, to shade, and uh, they're good, especially the Yopon, which is on the left, which is the evergreen, is a tremendous nesting site because it's kind of prickly on the inside, so it's harder for predators to get in there, like raccoons and such. And then, um, you know, it's just a great berry source. So in this picture, there are a bunch of cedar wax wings, and by the end of the day, in this really cold, kind of icy day, they had stripped this possum hot bear. So I encourage you to get acquainted with these particular plants. Because they, it's interesting to me because I think of them, I don't know, more as a blackland prairie sort of plant, except they, we do find them doing quite well in the hill country, at least in, in Travis County. So on the left, we have the Yopon, has evergreen kind of leathery feeling leaves that are more elliptical. And then on the right is the possum haw, which is a fleshier leaf that's deciduous again, kind of paddle shaped. And actually the berries ripen, um, it seems, earlier on the possum hop. So this is an example. These possum hop, these yopon berries are going to persist, you know, later through the winter where these might be eaten earlier in the winter. So 
you know, nature's trying to figure out how to stretch and make the food supply available for the birds for the whole time they need it. And one thing I'd like to challenge you to do is to uh, look at look at your um, all your yopons around town and see if you can spot the mockingbird that's probably sitting on top trying to guard its stash. Here's a Texas persimmon, a gorgeous little small tree that's um, got, it's known for its distinctive gray bark, which rivals the, dare I say it, the non-native crepe myrtle that people like to have. So, uh, so you can have a, a good bird tree with beautiful distinctive bark with the added benefit that it has Texas persimmon fruit. Here it is, it's a green fruit when I took this picture in August and then um, it'll ripen into a nice black fruit. So it, right, it's the fruits sometimes are ripe from like August through late July, August, September, and they're eaten by many species of birds plus other wildlife too, even coyotes and that kind of thing. So um, pretty easy to grow. Flame leaf sumac is gonna be coming on strong here. Right now it looks like this with these beautiful creamy panicles that will then turn to fruit uh, for the winter, which is really attractive to birds. And here's that fall color. You know, we do have a fall in Central Texas. Sometimes it doesn't seem like it, but the trees are telling the tale. So that's a flame leaf sumac, which is a, um, it's usually thicket forming, so it suckers. So if you need to control it, you can just mow it. And it's deciduous, usually no taller than 20 feet. It really does best in full sun, but I've seen it on the edge where it can get strong on the edge of a, a you know, a, like a forest setting in it, and it will do really well there. And so many birds will come in and eat the fruit, including cardinals, downy woodpeckers, eastern bluebirds, mountain bluebirds, if they show up, that kind of birds. Mexican buckeye, if you're looking for a plant to put under a utility um, wire, this is a good plant because it, it's multi-trunked and it grows more horizontally than vertically. In early spring, about the same time as the red buds bloom, this plant's blooming. So I think a lot of people actually mix them up. Um, so it, it attracts a lot of pollinators to it since it's an early source of nectar. Then it sets these really neat capsules with three kind of brown looking marbles in them, uh, which have supposedly are edible, but I don't know by whom. I have a friend who swears that this is the tree when uh, peak migration of warblers is April through mid-May. When that's going on, even though the boom, blooms are long gone, it's a really attractive uh, insect source to her, to the warblers coming through. So Mexican buckeye is, is a sun. This one's in full sun um, and part shade is really good for it too. And it's deciduous and sometimes in kind of drought conditions it will drop some of its leaves and look a little raggedy um, you know, later on in the summer. Uh, this is a plant that's kind of one of those holy grail plants. You hear about it in a talk like this and you go, oh, I want one of those. Well, it's kind of hard to find, but if you can find one, you should buy it because if you don't even want it, some, if you don't want it, somebody else is going to buy it from you. It's a rusty black haw. It really does best in part shade. It has really beautiful green glossy leaves. This one's at the Wildflower Center. It's already beginning to get some fall color. It has very distinctive bark. It's kind of, um, you know, it's described as separating into dark rectangular plates. And in this early spring, it has these beautiful, well, it's a viburnum, so these clusters of, of creamy white flowers. But to me, the most special part is the fruit. It's kind of like raisins, but um, they're, they, when they're ripe, they're this color, kind of the blue. These are not quite ripe yet, but I was at McKinney Falls State Park last October, and I saw this tree off in the distance, and I thought, is that a Mexican buckeye that's blooming in the fall? Maybe, 
you know, sometimes plants have that second spring, especially with good rains. But I got closer and I realized it was this. And so it's just a stunning, beautiful plant. You, you might want to look for because it, it will do very well up in, in uh, Williamson County. So again, part shade, rusty black haw viburnum. Okay, so now we get into our shrubs. I got to pick up the pace here a little bit, I think. So uh, shrubs, the definition is they're multi-trunked, three to 10 feet, and the stems persist through the winter. And I know there's some disagreement on how to classify these things, but American Beautyberry, everybody, you, there's ought to be some place in your yard where you can put one in. Uh, they really kind of like part shade um, conditions, so not full all day sun, although I've seen them, they'll just need more water in full sun. But big arching shrub, you want to give it space, but this is the payoff, these beautiful berries in, um, that begin to set, I'd say, in August, September, and they're really good looking now. And you'll have a lot of birds like orioles, tanagers, even yellow warblers in fall migration that will come in to eat this. So it is a deciduous plant. And um, um, what else can I say about it? It's, um, um, yeah, part, to, part sun, two to six hours of sun. If, you, if it is in drought conditions, like in the summer, sometimes the, you won't get any berry production. The berries that are there will shrivel up and you might have the plant defoliate. So in that case, you might wanna see if you can give it a little extra water. There's some controversy about whether or not you should cut this plant back. I have several in my yard and the biggest one I have never cut back and it maintains this lovely shape. But the ones that are in too much shade, I do cut them back because I think as they come back, they'll come back a little bit denser. Turk's cap, if you want hummingbirds, this is one plant you really need to get. And for those of you who live in deer country, this plant is not a big, um, it's not a big hit with the deer and they don't really browse it that much in my neighborhood. You can see these guys and they're avoiding it. So Turk's cap is, uh, to me, oftentimes I think of it as a back of the border plant, but really and truly it does very well. Freestanding like this where it's covering some people's electrical equipment and doing a very good job and feeding the hummingbirds too. Plus it's a big uh, plant for sulfur, butterflies, and your big swallowtails. And one interesting thing about it is that it can get chewed. I'm not sure by whom, but I'm kind of thinking now that I saw some the other day, shorthorn grasshoppers, and still it manages to bloom. And you can see why people would think, I better dust that with some kind of pesticide to stop whatever it is from chewing it. But really, it may not look beautiful, but it's still doing what nature wanted it to do, which is to support wildlife. And this is what the bloom looks like. So it's a really easy to grow plant. If you're a black thumb gardener, I'm telling you, you can, you can put this in and give it some water, get it started, and eventually you'll have a big stand of it. Um, so I encourage you to find this plant. Now here's a white mist flower, which some people prefer to call shrubby bone set. Here's the scientific name. Remember, I put it on all the slides. Here's one not quite ready to bloom in a pot at the Wildflower Center. This plant, get, it's a deciduous plant generally, but it gets, uh, can get three to six feet as a shrub. Um, it really does very well in full sun, um, but most people, I would say, put it more in part shade, dapple shade, it just won't bloom as much. But when it does, and it's, it's not, you all might be a little ahead of us, but mine is just about ready to pop. And when it does, it's gonna be covered with all sorts of butterflies. So I guess I'd probably put Turk's cap in, and this plant very, very much at the top of the list. Oh, because, hey, what? 
What about the birds? Well, lesser goldfinches love to come down and eat the leaves. And in the wintertime, I found don't cut it back until as late as you can stand. And you'll have a lot of birds that are coming through to eat the seed heads of it, like orange crowned warblers, ruby crowned kinglets. So cut it back late, you know, just before you think things are going to start popping out. And, um, and you'll be providing insects for, for those wintering birds. Aromatic sumac is a thicket forming shrub. It can, it can stay low, but it can also get fairly high, three to six. It's deciduous. It has a winter fruit that's red that persists until March. So it's feeding our wintering birds. Um, and you can put it where it's very easy to control, you know, in this type of environment where it's got it bounded by a sidewalk. So that might be something that you want to do. It seems in my yard, it took a little while to get established and now it is beginning to get a little enthusiastic, but sun to part shade to shade. And you can only get the berries on the females. Okay, flowering plants, plateau golden eye, one that's in bloom now, blaze of color huge for, um, we already mentioned it with the lesser goldfinches. Here's a bed back in August at the Wildflower Center. I was there today and it was just totally stunning. It's an open branching shrub as you can sort of see in this picture. Um, and then it's going to set seed. So it's a fall bloomer primarily, although you might get some blooms off and on in the summertime three to six feet tall and maybe a three foot spread. And it's easy to grow from seed. Salvias, so salvias, there are many salvias out there. We mentioned the mealy blue sage. Here are a couple more. Uh, salvias have square stems. That's and they're kind of aromatic. So some of them are rather deer resistant, but cedar sage really does very well in the duff or the cedar needles under ash juniper, that's what it's really adapted to. It does not really compete well with other plants, but here's a nice colony of it in full sun. And then here it is in more dappled shade and in pretty dry conditions. But uh, so it stays low and then it sends up a flower spike in, again, I'd say March, maybe April, May, for migrating hummingbirds in the spring. Tropical sage has kind of got a triangular leaf. This one's sort of rounded. This one's triangular and it, it blooms. It's a, an annual or a weak perennial. It blooms off and on, um, but really puts on a good show about now and attracts lesser goldfinches to eat the, the seeds out of it. And, um, and it, it attracts butterflies too. So it, the tropical gets about two to three feet tall. So it's going to be taller than this one. And, but it'll take all different sorts of lighting conditions and it recedes easily. They both look really nice as mass plantings, kind of to make a statement. And then it, uh, Randy already talked about frostweed and I agree with everything she said, but Gary, I've got you beat. Look at this frostweed. I'm 5'8 and this frostweed is almost double my height. <laughs> it's huge. So frostweed is such a butterfly magnet. Look at this. We have a tiger, eastern tiger swallowtail, a queen, a hair streak, and a monarch on it. And here's a poor little American lady being eaten by an ash-throated flycatcher, which is a backyard bird if you have more open habitat conditions. Okay, so grasses. <laughs> provide a lot of different ecosystem services really for our birds. You know, whether it's seeds or just the building block nest materials, whether uh, it's the shelter and nesting sites, because as hard as it might be to believe, there are birds that nest on the ground and they nest out in open fields like your Easton meadowlark and your, your quail if you have them, um, your rufous crowned sparrows if you're in the hill country, that kind of thing. Plus they provide shelter for other invertebrates and vertebrates that need it. Oh, so that was Mexican feather grass, which is truly not a central Texas plant, but it does pretty well here. It's got a nice flow to it. 
and uh, here's a robin in my yard that's collecting some of the the uh, leaves for its building its nest. Lindheimer, also called big muley, um, that's this plant right here, coming into its own just now with the fall panicles, and uh, so it it's a dramatic plant for your landscape as an accent plant or maybe even sort of a a property line divider type thing. And here's, here's another shot of it. So pretty adaptable, um, but it does like sun, I have to say, and sometimes a little bit more, more moisture. All of our grasses are looking really good this year because we had that nice September rain. <coughs> here's side oats grandma, which is our state grass. And it has all the little seeds on one side of the stem. It's very dainty looking. It's a nice bunch forming grass. I would say it doesn't really get more than maybe a couple feet tall. And uh, uh, like sun or sometimes slightly dappled shade. But uh, I've seen it in a rock garden used very effectively. And it could also be good in a, a meadow with spring blooming wildflowers because it's not going to get too tall and overwhelm them. And you might not be familiar with southwestern bristlegrass. This is a really good for, year for it. It likes disturbed soils and it kind of likes shaded conditions. So for a lot of this, it's like a lot of us, oh my gosh, a, a grass that grows in the shade that looks good and actually provides seeds for birds. What's not to like? So what's not to like is the fact that, you know, you could just can't walk to the store and get it. And, uh, but Native American seed, you can, you can order seed from them. And I have to tell you, I saw a big stand over at Hornsby Bend, which is our wastewater, solid waste treatment plant here in Austin. And I'm gonna wait for it to, the seeds to ripen and then I'm gonna go collect it. So if you're interested, it's over by the birding shelter, you'll just see a big expanse of it. But it's got a small seed, you know, unlike a bigger, like a sunflower seed, this, these are small round seeds in this plant and it's just the right size for things like our beautiful painted buntings or our wintering sparrows that are just now beginning to show up. <coughs> so, you know, I'm about ready to conclude here and I wanna say that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You know, there are plants that you wanna put in your yard and maybe there's some that you don't want to, but the birds really like and need and here's one, Virginia creeper. Some people don't like it, but the birds really do. Here's a little Eastern bluebird having a heyday in this Virginia creeper and all the berries are ripe. So the berries are ripe now, the birds are after them. And a lot of different species like this plant. This plant turns red in the fall, the leaves turn red. You know, so it's considered a foliar fruit flag and so that's advertising to the birds that we're ready, I'm ready for you to come eat me so you will spread my seeds. And here's a plant that, uh, that some people don't care for. It's a tremendous host plant for different butterflies, but it also has those little dried fruits that are big hits with wintering birds like uh, the northern flicker, which is a woodpecker, a prairie bird coming through during migration in the spring and Baltimore Orioles actually coming through in, in late April and early May. All these birds really like to eat the berries of the hackberry. And there are even some other native plants out there that you may not be fond of, but there's nothing cooler than to go to a place that does allow ragweed to flourish and watch it shake with all the cardinals that are in it. And then you look closer and you see things like little flycatchers in there too that are after the insects. So uh, even ragweed has a place. Pokeweed, pokeberry, you know. So I have to say that you heard that a, a plant, what is it? A weed is a plant you just, you haven't learned to love yet and that's kind of how some of these things are. So if you are not quite ready to accept ragweed and pokeweed or hackberries into your life, then I want you to think, you know, that's why we need to support our wild spaces like your, your wonderful work that you're doing up there in um, Berry Springs Preserve and at your new park. 
So the birds really need places that are not trimmed up to a fairly well, you know, because this to them, a lot of them is really good habitat for food, shelter, and places to raise their young. So with that, you know, I hear just some parting ideas. Think about reducing your lawn. You don't have to do it all at once. You know, try a shrub, you know, introduce that. Think, do I really need to spray that plant with a pesticide? Can I add any variety at all? Is there some way to add a new layer? Can I leave leaf litter if I need to move it somewhere? Can I move it somewhere and let it stay because I've got pupa of overwintering um, caterpillars, you know, there, the pupa? Uh, reduce deadheading, so let some plants go to seed. Provide water and keep kitty cats indoors because if you're going to attract these birds, you don't want them to be sitting ducks for, for those cats. So in conclusion, I hope that you know you've got an idea and you're you're interested in gardening for birds. If you're not really into birds, garden using the native plants and you'll attract other wildlife too, like those cool butterflies. So with that, I'm done. Um, and I guess, Gary, I guess you've got possibly got a few questions. For, I know I'm over a little bit. No, it, it's fine. It was right on track. Uh, we do have a few questions. Uh, one thing I did wanted to remind <laughs> folks as uh, people were asking me is that we are recording the session and we'll post this to our YouTube channel. Uh, Jane will get a chance to review it before we post it. Um, but thank you all for reminding me because I did start the recording maybe a few minutes into Jane's presentation. Um, so, so you get to skip Randy entirely if you want. <laughs> Sorry, Thanks. Randy. Oh, well. <laughs> um, so we do have a few questions. Uh, Jane, I'll, I'll look through and give most of these to you. Uh, we've got a couple of questions from Barbara Morrison. The first is, um, what birds uh, will eat grasshoppers? Oh, well, um, I'll tell you, it's interesting. I have seen robins with grasshoppers and I've seen uh, kestrels, which are a little falcon, which are not at all really a backyard bird. They eat grasshoppers. One of our big hawks, which is migrating through right now is the Swainson's hawk and they are big grasshopper eaters. They're again, not particularly a backyard bird, but uh, barn swallows eat grasshoppers. Mississippi kites, which are beginning to nest here in central Texas, are huge grasshopper eaters. So I hope that's enough examples. You know, the problem with a grasshopper for a, a regular kind of songbird is they're pretty crunchy, <laughs> you know, they've got a lot of chitin, this sort of shell on them. So they're not going to feed, the, feed their babies, the youngest babies, but like this thing right here in this robin, it, it, it almost looks like some, it's not, maybe not a grasshopper, but it's, it's pretty crunchy. But they have to wait till those little babies' intestinal tracts get a little stronger before they put something like that down them or they tear it apart for them. Okay. And, and Barbara mentions that she's in Young County and has been trying to attract bats, but that hasn't happened. Um, I don't have any experience with attracting bats. Um, I really uh, don't either. Uh, yeah. You know, I know people try those bat boxes and I hear that they're not that successful. Uh, so yeah. I can't help you there. I would go to Bat Conservation International or somebody like that and and look at their information. Yes, Sorry, I'm suggesting you build a cave, a cave on your property. <laughs> well, you know, that's what David Bamberger did. And at yes. first he was a laughing stock <laughs> of Blanco County until he finally attracted bats. And now it's a corruptorium. It's like, it was a big success, but I don't know if you want to do that on your land, Barbara. <laughs> You've got enough space, build yeah. a cave. Uh, but yeah, the, I think uh, reaching out to the Bat Conservancy, that, that's probably a, a good route. Um, okay, uh, I think I can take a stab at this one and then hand it over to, to you or Randy. Um, Martin asks that uh, HOAs like mine in Sun City don't allow leaf, leaf litter in beds. Uh. Uh, short of working to change the rules, 
Does it smother the overwintering hiding creature creatures to hide the leaf litter with a thin layer of mulch? Um, my suggestion on that would be to do uh, maybe some of the darker compost just so that it breaks that leaf litter down a little bit faster. But I'd be interested to see what you and Randy have to say. Um, I find uh, I have leaf litter in some of my beds. The more visible beds, no, I keep those mulched and a little cleaner in the back. I can leave leaf litter underneath trees under a, uh, have a mountain laurel has a lot of leaf litter under it. So they're not like poking around every plant in your yard. Uh, the other thing I do, I have a uh, bed that I let reseed with standing cypress, and I will use a very light layer of compost or mulch so that the seed can get through and make ground contact, but it looks like it's mulched. Right. So it's all about appearance. You want to make it look neat. You want to make it look clean and nice, and you can, you can get away with a lot. I like so. both of those answers, but I would say if you're trying to let your pupa overwinter, you don't want them to comp compost it. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but a light True. layer of dark compost will help hide it. Yeah, I Just see what you're it. saying. You put yeah. that on top of your leaves. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, but it has to be light. I'm sure you wouldn't want to crush them or yeah. smother them. And, uh, I don't know. People love to complain about HOAs. When I moved in, I was told I couldn't have native plants. <laughs> and, uh, so I proved them wrong. I'm 100% native. Are you really? That's very impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Even your grass? Even your... Uh, my little bit of grass is buffalo invaded with common Bermuda. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yes. But, uh, okay. yeah. Well. Thank you HOAs, that. you have to figure out what motivates them and then work with that. Well, Martin, I know you. Um, yeah. Couldn't you put them loose? Couldn't you put some of the leaf litter in loosely in a compost bin? I mean, just so it was kind of fluffed up and they wouldn't care. They wouldn't see that, would they? Seems like. But it's, you probably it's kind of like that. that uh, it's kind of like that weed ordinance, you know, they don't want to have a lot of weeds and unmowed grass and leaves everywhere and your next door neighbor complaining because the leaves are blowing into their yard. And, uh, so you, you just have to kind of work with it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can probably make an attempt at this next one and then see what you guys think. Uh, Robert. Camper asks, uh, in our neighborhood, we have a lot of Chinese elms, uh, which are lace bark elms, and that's Ulmus parvoflora or something like that. Uh, how's it different than cedar elm? And so if I were going to mm -hmm. stick with the Douglas Talame response, it would be, uh, you know, it's not native. Uh, so while it might be resistant to, you know, Dutch elm disease and that sort of stuff, which is probably why it was planted here in the U.S., um, it's also not going to support as many, it's not going to be a host plant for a lot of the, the insects and, and larva that we have. So it's not going to support as much wildlife or I don't know what the research is on it. It might not support any. Yeah, I don't know either because, I mean, we, yeah. Um, well, I don't know. It would be really hard for me to chop one of those trees down if it's already established but as soon as it looked like it was failing, I'd probably get rid of it and put something in that was native. Just yeah. depends on your tolerance level. For I don't know if the birds would eat the seeds off of it or how invasive Chinese elm is. Like if I don't it's, know. It's supplanting other things. I don't know. Uh, it is invasive. It's it listed is. on texasinvasives.org. And uh, also it... it Basically, okay. it's a uh, foreign plant that does not, will not support our wildlife as well as a native plant will because the native plants and the, and the uh, insect population and, and birds, et cetera, have evolved together. And there is a balance in nature and you introduce something new from outside, even from another state, uh, it doesn't provide the same services that our local plants will provide. Okay, very good. 
uh, Charles asking the controversial questions or uh -oh. making controversial statements. Ash junipers <laughs> drink a lot of water. So there's probably two schools of thought on that. Um, my thought is that I'm going, I already have one planted in my backyard and it seems to be fine and I'm not giving it any extra water and it doesn't seem to be harming anything else. Um, I know that the duff will capture a lot of water underneath them. Um, I'm sure that uh, Bamberger will have a different response to, to that. But uh, I'll let you guys, if you want to respond. Yeah. I, I don't know any scientific studies, but I do know that they're great soil builders. As the leaves uh, die and fall on the ground, it builds some very nice, rich soil. And there are plants that, uh, you know, like cedar, uh, well, I can't think that now, but anyway, cedar sage. there's a couple of plants. Cedar sage, yes. Mm -hmm. cedar, sage. cedar sedge, yeah. Cedar sedge right. that grow underneath an ash juniper just because uh, of the wonderful soil it builds. So it is a soil builder, and uh, there are, like Gary says, two stories to whether or not it uses a lot of water. Uh, one thing is it catches water on its branches and then it evaporates back into the air so it doesn't go into the soil. And I uh, think that's, that's, only in that's a, the yes. real answer. Well, and but that's only when it's a, sh a drizzly little rain. But when you've got a good gully washer, it goes yeah. right on through and recharges the aquifer. Yeah, that's true. Really, the, what I've read is that it really, it doesn't use any, mo any more water than any other tree. You know, yeah. it's based on the size. Tree. Yeah, I mean, just I, I, they need water. Yeah. So it's an excellent plant, and there's a reason it's mm -hmm. here. You know, now it's gotten out of out of bounds when it gets outside where it used to live, which was basically ravines and you know, the val in the in the canyons. Well, so and that's our fault again. Yeah. So right. We, 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 yeah, we suppressed. suppressed we don't like to live with wildfires. Yeah. Right, and uh, also overgrazing and and just the erosion of the land. And so the only thing that can establish is an ash juniper. So it's abused, abused land. Um, so Dallas asked about a YouTube channel. So I will, we'll, we'll have that posted. Uh, we don't have enough subscribers yet to have a vanity link. Uh, so it's this long, big string of random letters, Dallas. Um, so if you want to help us out with that, you can certainly subscribe to our channel once I get that posted. Yep. Once we get 100, we can have a vanity link, and uh -huh. I believe that nips up. We'll go like everything else. Oh, that's nice. Um, so, so we'll get that out for you. It'll be, um, it'll be probably on our blog once we post the, the recording for this. And then uh, Charles makes a good point here about uh, letting folks know that Nandina berries have cyanide in them. And that cedar wax, wax wings love to just gorge themselves on a particular plant whenever it's fruiting and that uh, it can kill them and also can scar the throats of robins. So, so some of these non-native plants can be detrimental to, to birds. Um, and then uh, suggest, you know, if you've got an andina, maybe you want to dig it up and replace it with something native like a, a yopen holly something that has uh, some similar berries for it. Mm -hmm. Anything else you might suggest to replace uh, Nandina with? I would say anything agarita. else. I love <laughs> an agarita myself. Well, I think also, I didn't mention it, but um, but the Barbados cherry, which is really not truly mm -hmm. native to Austin or, you know, this part of yeah. Texas, but it's a very nice wildlife plant. And it gets a nice red berry and it sort of to me has the same shape. You can keep it trimmed. Um, so that's mm -hmm. Barbados cherry. But well, I really we're getting warmer. So Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you know, it's 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 kind of could freeze back. Y'all are a little further north than we are here. But I haven't had an issue with that. The Wildflower Center, I was talking to them because they have it down there and it has frozen back, but it's it's your little microclimate that's gonna make a difference. Um, yeah, and whether right. I think it survives or not. And I'll tell mm -hmm. you, I guess one year mine froze a little bit, but it bounced right back. 
So okay, that's very good. That looks like mandina. I haven't tried that one. So um, Mary asked, "Will any plant you mentioned tonight grow in Galveston?" Yep. Probably Barbados cherry. We just mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, there, Mary. There's a uh, the native the wildflower center has a plant collections section. I think maybe if you uh -huh. Google search plant collections, they it'll get you into a list for coastal Texas. Um, and those would be the plants I would look at seriously to to see because there would probably be some coral yeah, honey speckle, muley. perhaps, huh? Gulf, yeah, Gulf muley for sure. We didn't mention that, but yeah. it's one of the muleys. It's grass. Uh, what do you think coral yeah. honeysuckle? Possibly. I, I don't really know. I don't know. I mean, you gotta, uh, yeah. they need to take more water. And, I'll, um, I'm, I'm salt, posting to Mary to also check out the, uh, the Houston chapter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That might be a good resource good to point. reach out to. Right. Cause I, we didn't, yep. I, didn't you put that link up for the Nipsot? You go to Nipsot resources and you can find the, the links for the different plant lists for different regions of the state. So I would look there too. Yeah. But it's the same uh, right. idea. Look for burying plants, look for pollinator plants, you know. Um, okay. Plant list by region. Let's see. Got a few other. But the areas. Houston chapter is very yeah. active. Yeah, I think yes. Houston and, uh, is the very one. involved. So that'd be your best bet. Yeah, there it's got, yeah, it's under Nipsot or resources plant list and it's the Houston area and you can download a big Excel list. Yep. Uh, so it's Dallas mentions the chickens eat grasshoppers. So yeah, yes, that's, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's very true. And Barbara says, thank you for all the, the answers and responses. So you're very welcome. And are magnolia see. trees good for birds? That was my next one. Yeah, so actually, um, I've, I've seen summer tanagers in magnolias. And you know, the interesting thing is they grow them over at the state capitol. You've got some magnolias in some of the common areas there. And they hold water. So birds go get, they'll go and they'll drink some of the water out of them. I have no idea what else they might use the magnolia for, though, really. But yeah, it's it isn't it native somewhere in Texas? It east, east? Uh, yes. East, so uh, yes. I would imagine that that there's some value to them, to it. Yeah, and if you're trying to grow them here in central Texas, they're going to require a bit more water. I've yeah, and soil. <laughs> yeah, so so on the blackland side. Uh, definitely. Um, I've got one in my front yard that I guess someone had planted before I bought the property and it's stayed exactly the same size for the last eight years. It's not really that happy here. Um, it really does need a little bit more moisture and soil. I'm looking at the Native Plant Information Network and they don't really say anything. They just say it's an ornamental um, conspicuous flowers, fragrant flowers, instrument. It doesn't say anything. A lot of times that this website, you know, the Wildflower Center website, they'll say if it's special importance to bees or it has, it attracts pollinators or it has nectar and it doesn't really say anything for that, which is interesting. Hmm. Yeah, however, I did find something interesting from Texas A&M and it said there's at least a hundred species of magnolia Oh. From East Asia to the Americas, oh. share share the magnolia genus, but the, but the one most familiar to us and the one which is truly an emblem of the South is Magnolia grandiflora, and that's an evergreen native tree to stream and river beds in East Texas and the South. So look for Magnolia grandiflora if you get one. Yeah, and and the grandiflora means it's the ones with the big white flowers. Yeah. So the evergreen. So and what we call Southern Magnolia. So. Okay, that was a good question. I moved and I moved. Huh. And 
I'm assuming that was here in Central Texas, Charles. Okay. Well, I think we've kind of exhausted everybody. Uh, <laughs> we, we've lost 20 folks, so so it's it's that's good. We had that's a good question and answer too. session. Um, the, the last thing I'll say here is that we've got a, do have a post in the discussion from Nancy suggesting that maybe Queen's Wreath and uh, Passiflora. Uh, is Queen's Wreath native? That's by Ooh, Rhea, isn't it? Good question. I mean, if it's by Rhea, it's not. I, guess it I, don't, depends I on... don't think it is. Now, the Passiflora, it depends on which Passiflora you're talking about. Um, yeah. You know, Fetida works and... Uh, Passiflora, hmm, let me see. Uh, oh, Incarnata is Incarnata. native, and that's a nice one. We actually have that on yeah. our, our bird list for Austin. It's just, you know, I have 50 plants on the bird list for our NLCP. For, uh, okay. <laughs> you just can't yes. talk about them all at yeah. once. So. Yeah, okay. Nancy says it's not Spirea, but I still don't think it's native queen tree. <laughs> Stop it, Nancy. <laughs> You're going to make me have to look it up now. Well, you know, the uh, birds might be looking names. it up. That's the one they'll remember and go by. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, Enough trouble. Well, good night. I, I'm. Are you scary. out, Randy? All right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks yeah, so out. much, uh, Jane. Uh, definitely All appreciated right. it. We'll uh, upload this YouTube and then I'll send it to, to you, Nancy, to review. Or sorry, <laughs> see, Nancy's the troublemaker now. I'm going to send everything to her. I will send it That's to you right. and Randy to review, and then okay, uh, great. You know, All let right. me know if there's anything you want to change. Sounds excellent. Thank you, Gary. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Jane. Thank you. All. Appreciate it. And thank everyone for tuning in. Yes, definitely. We're glad you came. All right. Good night. Good night. Take care.